destiny. Hallelujah. I just want to very quickly go over, so we have some understanding in the back of our minds, really where we are on God's timetable, you know, where we are in God. And, um, you know, the children of Israel came out of Egypt, kept the Passover, which spoke of our salvation, right? And then went 50 days through the wilderness, and it came to Mount Sinai. Now, that's where the church has come and camped. We got saved, you know? The Passover lamb that came out of Egypt. We went for 50 days. 50 speaks of what? Pentecost, a Hebrew word for Pentecost, 50. We went 50 days to Mount Sinai. We saw the fire on the mountain. We had all of that. And we kept the feast of Pentecost and stayed there. That's it. Because Pentecost, that's it. There's nothing more, is there? <laughs> oh, yeah. He took them on right to the border of the Promised Land and said, there it is. That's where you're going. That's the Promised Land. There was a place called Kadesh Barnea. They could actually see into the Promised Land. And uh, so they sent out spies. Okay. They all came back, 12 of them. 10 says, we can't do it. Only two. You know the majority is not always right. <laughs> you got to be careful with that. They said, no, there are giants in the land. You know, it's incredible, these people. They just come out of Egypt where God had devastated the Egyptian empire. I mean, just devastated them. And they're afraid of a few giants in the promised land, you know. I mean, it doesn't add up, you know. They said, no, we can't go in. Joshua and Caleb said, yes, we can. He said, you know, we love giants. We love taking them out. This is what God does, you know. No, so they cried all night. Can you believe this? They cr actually cried. It tells us that. They cried all night. <laughs> in the morning they said, all right, maybe we will go in. God said, it's over. 39 years you go back into the wilderness. And he said, well, not only that, you'll die in the wilderness. Now, Pentecost is in the wilderness. When I say that, some people look a bit stunned, you know, because we think Pentecost is the epitome of everything. What more else is there? There's the promised land. They didn't go in. Died off in the wilderness. God had to bring a new generation up to take them in. We're right at that point. You know, there was one demarcation line between the wilderness and the promised land. That was the River Jordan. All I had to do was cross the River Jordan. That was all. Just, just get out there and go across and they were in. That's all I had to do. You know? But they didn't do it until the second generation came along and it says they were ready to go. And the ark went ahead. The ark speaks of who? Jesus? 2,000 cubits, 2,000 years ahead of us, he crossed over. Now, it's our turn. Cross over. And it says, you know, the river dammed up at a place upstream at a town called, what? Adam. You know, that's not by chance. You see, when they crossed over, a new kind of people are going to cross through that river, come up into the promised land with the whole Adamic nature dealt with. They're going to walk in newness of life and spirit and, and walk with God, you know. And uh, that's kind of where we are. But you know, in Hebrews chapter 4, let's turn across to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews is one of my favorite books. Hebrews chapter 4. Now, you've got to understand that 
Paul is writing to a Pentecostal church, a fully fledged Pentecostal church, okay? Now keep that in the back of your mind. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left to us of entering into his rest or into the promised land, any of you should come short of it. And then it says they didn't enter in because of unbelief. You see, the promise now is ours to enter in. But he said, let us. Be careful now. Lest the, the promise be left of us that we, we don't enter in. But we which, in verse 3, if we which have believed do enter into rest. You know, it's very, very interesting. The promised land was always, in the book of Deuteronomy, always referred to as their rest. You know what the hardest thing is in today for us to come into rest? It is the most difficult thing for us to do. And he said, this promised land, you're going to come into rest. You're not going to no longer be you, you know, it's going to be God. You've just got to relax, chill out, and let God work through us and do it, you know. Yeah. We're going to have to come into our rest. And I have sworn in my wrath that they would not enter in. Even though the works were finished from the foundation of the world, they couldn't enter in. And then in verse 10, For he that has entered into his rest or the promised land, he has ceased from his own works. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, in Hebrews chapter 6, it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the same old foundations of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, the resurrection of dead, the eternal judgment. This we will do if God permit. Okay, he said, okay. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again these things. You know, salvation, baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit, the resurrection of the eternal judgment. That's the Pentecostal manual. That's where they send around these truths, right? That's it. He said, you know, we've got to go on. We've got to move on in God. Where to? Well, a little later in Hebrews, Paul really talks about it very clearly. Hebrews chapter 12. You know, we're accompanied by a great cloud of witnesses. Hebrews chapter 12. And they're watching us. Hallelujah. They, they are encouraging us. They're saying, come on, you can do it. You can go way past where we went. You can go on. You can come on, you know. And uh, in verse 18, finally, Paul, verse 18, Paul finally says, For you are not come unto the Mount Sinai that might be touched and burnt with fire or blackness. That was Pentecost, remember? Fifty days out to Mount Sinai. We experienced Pentecost. And the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the words and so on. For they could not endure. But it says, verse 22, But you are now come to Mount Zion. Now, a different experience altogether, you know. It's a whole different realm in God, Mount Zion. You come into the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. Alright? Innumerable company of angels. That's what we have here today, you know. Numerable company of angels to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn which is written in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect and to Jesus. See, he's saying in this realm it's a whole different realm. You're going to be aware of large companies of angels working with angels, seeing angels. The church in heaven, spirits of just men made perfect all of these things. This is a place of an open heaven where we work out of. Instead of working down here at Pentecost level, we work out of an open heaven with awareness in the realm of God and the Spirit and spiritual things and we work accordingly with that. This is a place, you see, that God wants to bring us to. We're heading to Mount Zion now, which is an open heaven. 
And if, you know, these mindsets have to be broken, that, you know, Pentecost, we've got it all, we speak in tongues, we move in the gifts of the Spirit, oh, isn't it wonderful, we've got it all. Well, if you, we had it all, why haven't we reached this generation yet? We've had 50 years yet. Yeah. Try. Hallelujah, it's getting quiet now. <laughs> you see, it's very, very easy to get settled just to be settled. You know, the wilderness was quite good, really. They had manna from on high. Okay? The shoes never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. They had water from the rock. They had the pillar of fire. They had the cloud. They had all of these things. They had no bills to pay. That was, why swap it for something unknown? You see? You say, well, where did the pillar of fire go anyway when they crossed into the promised land? It vanished. And the pillar of fire is now internalized. The manna is internalized. Hallelujah. All of these things, the cloud goes with us now. See? Let us go on. Now, whenever somebody preaches, let us go on, we get a lot of affirmation, say, yes, yes, that's what we want to do. But five years later, they're no further on. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? You know, that's incredible. You come back five years later and think, oh, they're even worse off than the last time I came. <laughs> Nobody moved on. You see, because we make choices... We make decisions, may not be verbally, but in our heart, we make decisions, we make choices. And out of that, blindness comes. We don't hear anymore, and a, and, and a pseudo comfort, comfortable situation sets in. And that we actually cannot move on. Because we're locked into that. You know, it's very, very, very interesting. In Mark chapter 8, there's an interesting story about Jesus who... Um, healed a blind man, you know, in Mark chapter 8, and uh, verse 22 it says, remember this story, he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man unto him, and uh, besought him to touch him, alright, you remember that? And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands upon him, asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, mm, yeah, kind of, I see men as trees walking. Not quite clear yet. After that, Jesus put his hands on his eyes again and made him to look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And uh, he sent him away to his house saying, don't go back into that town you came from. And don't tell anybody in that town what happened. Isn't that a strange thing? I mean... You know, if that was you and me, they'd say, go back in the town and tell everybody. <laughs> right? <laughs> Bring them all. You know? Kind of interesting. This town, Bethsaida, was very, very interesting because it tells us in Matthew chapter 11 and 20, it says that Jesus had had meetings in, this, in, in Bethsaida early in his, in his ministry and with great signs and wonders and truth. And they rejected it. And it says, you know, if this, the signs had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. That's what he said about this town of Bethsaida. Same town. Now, Jesus comes back to this town, and because they rejected it, refused, that man was symptomatic of everyone in that town. They were now all spiritually blind. You know, that's why he said, you know, and Jesus had to take him out of the town before he could heal him. Yeah. Now think about that. And then he had, the only person we see in scripture where Jesus had to pray for someone twice to get them healed. He's the only one. Wow. See? Spiritual blindness. And truth has come over and over to you people in, in America. And, and, and through the prophetic movement over the last few years, if we don't move on now, that blindness will come. That's, we will settle. And you won't even know you've done it. You see, you'll settle in. 
Okay, what we have is good, we're happy. Oh, that's where we are. Okay, hallelujah. You know, the same yesterday that the angels, a lot of angels, which were ministering angels in this nation, left a number of years ago and uh, left the churches to themselves. And uh, it was very, very kind of interesting. It's only in the last... I spent a lot of time here in the 70s, a lot of time ministering in America. And the Lord said to me, at one point, you're not to go back. I'm lifting my grace off America. And I thought, Lord, why? Anyway, that's another story. He's lifting his grace off. And it was only in the last five years that he's allowed me to come back to this nation. And I want to tell you, the angels are returning. They are coming back. And, uh, you know, the angels are coming back. Destiny has arrived. Hallelujah. They're coming back. And uh, it's like, when I told you about that experience I had, you know, in the garden, how the garden and finally got into the most holy place and the light started to clean through the garden and so on, the Lord spoke to me and said, tell the people in America that the seraphims and the cherubims are coming. And those angels are returning back to this nation. And we need to understand, you know, angels, many angels are carriers of the anointing. They are carriers of the presence of God. And, uh, for instance, there are, there are angels of healing which carry the anointing for healing and work with the person who's ministering healing. There are uh, angels like the seven spirits of the Lord, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Remember Charles Finney? He just need to get on a, a tram and not open his mouth and people would be convicted because that angel was with him everywhere he went. <laughs> And it was shedding off the fear of the Lord, you know. Wherever Charles Finney went, that angel trudged behind him, you know. Couldn't get away from it. Walked into a factory and everybody came under the conviction of the power of God. See, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. These are ministering angels who, you see, who minister. The Bible talks about this, to minister to those who, and for those, and to those, and through those who are heirs of salvation. You see, hallelujah. Destiny. You know, the white horse speaks of movements. God's going to raise up some new things in the earth. He's going to raise up new movements. Kind of, when I talk about movements, just raise up new things that will impact the nation. And, uh, you know, it's going to be wonderful. The last few days I have sensed that in this part of the earth, Moravian Falls, that there's been a sifting going on and a repositioning taking place. Now I don't know anything about this place, so I, you know, I've just arrived and I've been locked away since then. <laughs> Stephen can't be locked away, you know. <laughs> you so I don't know anything, but there's been a sifting. I saw this, you know, like a pan for gold or something, whatever, they shake it in the water and it what's the lot of stuff falls out. I saw that sifting, that sifting, I saw repositioning, people moving, come, been coming, and, go, and something has been taking place because it's, it's, it's preparation. There are new movements going to arise up here. And, and you know, Stephen, if you will build it, they will come. Yeah. It's your field of dreams, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. They come. I saw what I saw was I saw lights, traffic, ca- lights of cars streaming up to that place, streaming up the mountain. Ca- lights, cars coming. They'll come. Hallelujah. New movements, new things are going to be raised up in God. They are white horses, you see. And uh, oh, it's going to be exciting. And the order is this destiny comes first, then come the seraphims. And then will come the cherubim. It's in that order. These angels are going to return. And uh, it's going to be exciting. Hallelujah. Oh. Exciting. Uh, you know, on the 1st of July this year, uh, 
I was praying, sitting in my lounge chair, and it was dark, and I was just praying. And as I, as I began to pray, I suddenly I had this thing which I was seeing. I was seeing the Lord picking up sticks. And what, you know, you, I don't know anybody else sees the Lord picking up sticks. <laughs> I was watching this. He was picking up sticks. It was a grassy area. And I, and I thought, that is strange. That is strange. Maybe I had too much coffee last night. <laughs> Picking up sticks. And he placed the wood in small piles. And, uh, and he looked up at me and said, Do you want to help me? Just like that. I said, Yeah, I'll help you. I'm not sure what you're doing, but I'll help you. <laughs> so I started to help him pick up these sticks and put them in piles. And then he said, It's enough. And uh, the Lord just went like this to each pile. <sighs> and it burst into flames. You know, to each one. And then I saw these, some, some of these piles start to join together. And then it suddenly it changed. It, 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 um, I was like high above America. And I could see the outline of America. It was like a satellite view, but I could see the outline of America, and I could see these fires all over the place, studying up here on the east, working down through many, many places in California. I saw fires starting in California, you know, in a very, very real way. And um, I was just kind of watching this, and it was kind of interesting. And uh, some of them began to join together and become bigger. The thing I saw, there was no smoke. You know, we're like, you, you're California, you have some real fires, you know. Well, Australia's like that. You, everyone in Australia is just sensitive to fire. Because we've had some horrific fires in Australia, bushfires. And they can travel so fast. And the problem is in Australia, most of our trees are gum trees. And they're full of gum. And I have seen before the fire, 50, 50 yards before the fire reached them, I've seen a huge gum tree just explode with the heat. Wow. Just explode in the flames like that. And so we understand fires, you know. But as I, I looked down, as some fires joined, and, and it was, you know, it was wonderful. And uh, there was no smoke. And then I kind of got a view which was real close up, and there were people in these fires. And um, I, I said to the Lord, you know, Lord, what's happening? He said, when these people emerge from their fire, from the fire, then they will be ready for the cherubims to come. And I thought, oh, okay. These people kind of, they emerged from the fire, they were glowing, their skin was smooth, almost glass-like. Um, there was not a wrinkle er anywhere. You know, I just settle down, I think it was spiritual I was saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but I do remember again thinking, beauty salons would make a fortune out of this. The Lord just looked at me and smiled, you know, again. And... Uh, these people, you know, had a look of them. They had a look about them which was almost the hair and their look was almost they looked like lions. And um, I thought, ooh, you know. And the Lord said to me, what you are seeing now, I'm about to do next. I will purify my people with fire. And I thought, then he said a strange thing. He said, like the phoenix, they will arise and go forth across the land. Not the city of Phoenix, but like this, you know, the mytho mythological bird, Fe the phoenix. And, uh, oh, this is God's season. He's coming forth also as a lion in this season. It's time for him to come forth as a lion. Oh, I could tell you some stories about lions. I won't go into that now. But, you know, oh, God's going to do it. It's going to be a purifying, you see. And when he looked at me and he said, I will do it. 
that came over me when he said that, an incredible sense of awareness, but it was deeper than that, that only he could do it. We cannot generate this. We can position ourselves to receive it. But only he can do this. He is control of what angels go away, you know. And um, I thought, oh yes. Then I saw these people going across the land. They were healing the sick. And the power of God was flowing through them unhindered. They were casting out demons. They were emptying psychiatric hospitals. It was an unbelievable. They were stopping plagues and hurricanes. They were letting some hurricanes through. But they were stopping others. You see, you can only must work in the will of God. And that, that, that's very, very important. But, you know, and uh, their words were instantly manifest. The words they spoke were instantly manifest. You know? And, uh, you know, I, I became aware that God was speaking through them. Now, whatever God spoke through them happened. And uh, the Lord spoke to me, tell the people they must give themselves to me. You will not be changed unless you come in humility and sincerity and ask me to do this. And I said, Lord, I will tell them. I will tell them in America. I will tell them. He said, ask me to do this. The scene changed. And I was looking at some awesome creatures. They seemed quite fierce, yet the feeling was fierce, that they looked benign. You know, I can't explain that. They stood by the throne of God and above it. And I said to them, Lord, what are these? And I looked at these. He said, these are my seraphims. They were like blow torches, I tell you. They had a noise about them. I thought, if you got anywhere near these guys, you'd really be in trouble. You know, they, they, they were just like a blow torch. Blue fire. And I thought... Whew. I thought, yeah. And again, he pointed his finger at me and said, Tell them in America, the seraphims are coming. Just one in the midst of your church will start a revival. He said, They will burn out the darkness, the sin, and the results of sin, and they will activate mantles that have already been given. And I thought, Oh, okay. Hallelujah. You know, the nature of revelation is that when God gives us revelation, it's not just information. Revelation carries with it the power to activate it. And the power to walk in it. All that comes with the package. It's not just insight. But with revelation, when true revelation comes to us, with that comes the ability to walk in it. That's given to you at that point of time. If you choose to walk in it, you will be able to. And let me say this, I've said it many times. Once you have done something once, you can do it again. Yeah, that's right. You know, quite often we have um, sovereign experiences and we say, oh, that was just sovereign. I wish it could happen again. No, God gives you sovereign experience to activate something within you so that you can walk in it from then on. We don't understand that. We cut it short, you know. That sovereign experience might have been sovereign. You didn't start it. You did nothing to do with it. It was just God did it. And you say, wow, I wish that could happen to me again. Well, it can happen to you again. Because it's now established and set within you. And you can walk in it. That door is opened now. You see? And uh, then he said this. And he read a scripture to me. And it was from Hebrews again. He, Hebrews 12.25. It says, tell the people this. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. When the Lord speaks to us. For if they escape not who refused them who spake, spoke on earth. Much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven. Whose voice then shook the earth. That was Sinai. But now has promised saying yet one more time I shake not the earth only, but also the heavens. And this, this word, yet one more, signifying the removing of those things that are shaken. Everything that's not of God can be shaken out. As of things that are made. And those things which cannot be shaken will remain. So, I will receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. 
let us have grace whereby we might serve God acceptably with reverential and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. And when he spoke those words, the words were so powerful I could not stay on my feet anymore. The, just the word, the force of the words and the way he spoke it. And I felt myself sinking, you know, sinking down. And then I, I was aware of me sitting in my chair, you know, looking out across the valley to the mountains on the other side of the valley. And the, the sun was just coming up and it was just catching the top of the mountains. Uh, and it looked like they were on fire, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was, you know, reminded me of that scripture in Hebrews 1.7. Uh, he maketh his angels spirits and his ministers. You are all ministers of your God. You ministers of flame of fire. You know, hallelujah. God's going to purify the church. Is that what you want? He's going to do it, you know. It takes fire. The, you know, the roots of sin, the effects of sin is so deep in many lives. Uh, you know, you, there's only one way to get it out, and that is through the fire of God. And, um, you know, things you've struggled with for years and not been able to overcome, some of these real deep things in our lives, you struggle and struggle, and despite all the teaching and all of this, they're still there. You know what I'm talking about? Don't look at me, that innocent, you know. <laughs> Come on. Something can only be gotten out with the fire, you know. Oh, the word seraphim is the Hebrew word of, from the Hebrew word seraph, and seraph is the Hebrew word for burning. It's what it means. And it says in Isaiah four and verse four, when the Lord have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment. And by the spirit of burning. The spirit of the seraphims. See, that's what it literally is meaning. It literally means, hallelujah. Then, the Lord says, I, the Lord, will create on every dwelling place on Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud by day and a shining flaming fire by night. See, that's what God wants to give you in your life. That's who you should become. Yeah. A cloud should be following you. The cloud of glory you should carry with you. And the fire of God, a cloud by day, is going to cleanse the church with spirits of burning. Yeah. Now, the fact that you're hearing this, it is possible for you to enter into it. Yeah. The fact, you know, I'm telling you this, brings a responsibility. There are countless, countless thousands of Pentecostal Christians in this nation who are not hearing anything like this. But the fact that you are hearing it carries with it a responsibility. Remember the old blind man? He carries with it a responsibility to respond to it adequately. To position ourselves and say, Lord, yeah, I believe this. This is what I really want. I need this in my life. Whatever it takes, do it, you know. And uh, it's going to cleanse the church with spirits of burning. Then, after that is finished, oh, then the cherubims are coming. These are not little cute little guys with bow and arrow, you know. They're all very different, I tell you. Hallelujah. You know, the, the Six-Day War in, in June 1967 in Israel broke out on the Feast of Weeks. Okay, they went 50 days, so many weeks, 49, and 50 days to Pentecost. And they were, in Israel, they were keeping the Feast of Pentecost. The, literal, the Jewish nation were keeping the Feast of Weeks, or the Feast, Feast of Pentecost. When that war broke out, okay, and it was a very difficult war, but it was a short war for Israel, you know, Egypt from the south, Syria from the north, uh, and, uh, and I mean, they were completely outnumbered, incredibly outnumbered, and uh, only God could save them, and uh, God did save them. You know, there were whole um, platoons of Egyptian and Syrian soldiers surrendered, before the Israelis fired a shot in the open desert warfare and they, 
and they all lay down their, their, their arms some of them ran away and when the Israelis caught up and then said what is the matter with you guys you know you're supposed to be fighting us and they said the Israeli, these, these sins didn't you see the angels didn't you see the angels standing behind you we're not going to go up against these guys that's exactly what these hardened generals were saying to the Israelis and I think oh if it wasn't for God they would have been annihilated you know but it heralded something because it happened on the feast you see of Pentecost that year the charismatic move broke out <laughs> spread across the world like a fire and that was a wonderful move of God you know it was really it was kind of a, a wonderful move of God the Jesus revolution we'll call it what you like the charismatic move it lasted approximately seven years before it started to wane and uh, that Pentecostal experience crossed over all denominations see God was giving the whole church the experience of Pentecost the Lutherans came into it the Baptists came in all kinds of churches in the Catholics flooded in were filled with the Holy Spirit it was a wonderful time but on the October the 6th 1973 I was in Israel and the Lord had just arranged for us to fly from New York to Israel and, and I was in Israel and the Day of Atonement, the Atonement War broke out and I thought, oh no <laughs> Day of Atonement is not kind of happy time you know, it's like <laughs> and the charismatic move began to wane God says, I've got to purify this thing you know the Day of Atonement. They won the war, but it was highly costly. They lost them more men in that war than the Six Day War, the Israelis. Some, you know, they had, the Israelis had this habit of taking the men, all the men of one village, and, fl and forming one platoon out of them. And in the early stages of that war, whole platoons were wiped out. Israeli platoon. Which means no men returned to those villages at all. Ever again. You know, it was a very difficult war and uh, you know but then we came to this if you go back to the six day war when this thing all started it was 40 years ago and 40 years in scripture is symbolic of one generation generations in scripture were counted as 40 years and uh, one whole generation since that six day war when Jerusalem came back in the hands of Israelis in that six day war one whole generation has come to an end Pentecost has come to an end and a new generation is ready hopefully to cross Jordan and go into the promised land that's where we are at right now if we hear and we can respond adequately you know to that Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was sitting high on the throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each had six wings. And with twain covered his face, and with twain covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory okay it's where the cherubims were calling now the message was holiness okay and really what they were saying is when we are finished with you the whole earth will seem to be full of the glory of God that's what they were saying and uh, they touched the lip of Isaiah you know Isaiah was a good man just like you and I but he lived in a world an unclean world people who with unclean mouths an unclean world this is what he said and he said Lord I didn't know I was like this until this came upon me this fire until I'm in your presence and he said oh I'm unclean I'm a man of unclean lips because I dwell among the people who just like that see it rubs off on us and we don't even know it and the angel flew and touched his mouth he said, your iniquity is purged. Your sin is purged. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. 
and the spirit of the fear of the Lord came upon him. Oh, hallelujah. He said, I'm undone. Oh, glory to God. You see, turn of the 19th century and, and, and a little earlier than that, there were great men of God. Charles Finney, another kind of, that, that era, through that era, great men of God came on the scene. Spurgeon, Moody, and all these guys, you know. And uh, they had experiences which we don't have today. You know? Some of them were baptized in the Spirit and spoke in tongues, but the main thing that happened to them in those days, which they called an experience of sanctification, was the baptism in fire. And we Pentecostals th thought we knew it all. <laughs> came along, a charismatic move came, everybody's getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, but there was no fire. <coughs> the fire was missing. That's why we had problems with Christians and demons. The fire hadn't burned them out. Wow. And so, we had, oh. I've listened to some of those testimonies. We, I, I had in the early 70s a, a Mennonite pastor come to my church and Gerald Durstein, if you know him, Gerald yeah. Durstein, came to my church and he told us of an experience he had and his wife. He said, we would come to the altar in our little church and we'd seek the Lord for sanctification. And God would deal with our hearts. And we'd have to put things right. And this process would go on for quite a long time. And he said, but one day, he said, suddenly God came. And he said, the fire of God swept through us for days upon days upon days. And he said, when we come out of that experience, everything in the world looked different. The plants, the houses, the trees, everything looked different. And they hadn't yet been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I, you know, some of those guys, even though they weren't, as we understand, baptized in the Holy Spirit, accomplished more than we did with just the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But when you put the two together, hallelujah. Mm. Glory to God. Luke, 13, Luke 3, 16. And John answered and said unto him, saying, All I need to baptize you is in water, but one mightier than I cometh, whose latches are of shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. And... Then the result of this, whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor, your floor, your life. He will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And that's what is missing. You see? And like it or not, Pentecostal or not, it is missing. We are not baptized with fire. We are baptized with the Holy Spirit but no fire. Oh, hallelujah. You see, fire is not for cleansing of sin. It's for purging, refining. It deals with the consequences of sin that's left in our lives. The problems that sin has left in one life. The pollution that sin causes. It also deals with the demonic. Demons cannot stand the fire. You see? And... Uh, Oh, hallelujah. You know, the fire will deal with all of those real problems. So there's some emotional problems that people have, you know, and, and they get counseling and kind of therapy for years and years before you can even get them a little bit right. The problems are so deep, you see. The fire can deal with that in one minute. MPD, you know, all of those problems, memories, really bad memories, can't get them out. Things that have happened to children and so on. And pollution, hereditary problems. Oh, hallelujah. The seraphims are coming. Thank God. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. You know, he's coming for a perfect church. And no matter how much we try, we can't get perfect. <laughs> but God's going to do it. If that's what we want. If that's what we believe can happen, if that's what we believe God is saying, God can do it. And it's on his 
schedule. You say schedule or schedule? Schedule. Ske- schedule. Okay, on your schedule. All right. It's on his schedule. Okay. And he said, he told me directly to tell you when I was in America, they're coming. The angels are returning back to this nation. And uh, God has a way of doing it, you know. Hallelujah. And once the fire has done his work, you'll see God in everything. You know, those angels said the whole earth is full of his glory. It was something. Holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. You'll see God in everything. You'll see God in this. It's not dead, you know. It's like some Christians, but it's not quite dead yet. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's full of the life of God. Yes. Full, teeming with the life of God. Yes. Every molecule, every atom, going on down, every quark, every piece of string in it, filled with the life of God. And you'll see God in everything. I sat outside one night and it was so deafening and where I live. So deafening with the crickets and the frogs and the owls. I mean, it was like it's an orchestra. Sounded a bit out of tune, but it was like an orchestra, you know. And I was thinking about this, and God said, yeah, everybody praises me. They're singing to me. You know, they're singing my song. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we sit outside every morning, my wife and I, and we, we pray. You pray for my wife. I've given her a hard time through the years, you know. <laughs> I mean, I've dragged her from here to there to there to there. She doesn't have a home anymore because we had to sell it up and give it a work, give it to, get, to go to travel where we are living now. We rent a home. And, uh, and you know, a woman needs a home. Of her own, bless your mind, because you're very artistic. But <laughs> how do I get on to that? Oh yeah. <laughs> we were sitting outside where we have communion every morning, and the weather's usually always warm and fine. Even though it's spring now, there and the temperatures are around about 80 at the moment, and we sit outside and we have communion. Then we have coffee. Not decaffeinated, the real stuff, coffee. (laughs) And, um, you know, we just talk about the Lord. We talk to the Lord. Many times we've been there, angels will come. Angel came the other day. When I slipped in to turn the coffee machine off, my wife was sitting there. (laughs) (laughs) What? This huge angel with a key round his neck, you know. Came to her, not to me. Wait till I gone. <laughs> These are the kind of experiences we have. Just just being with God. That's all. Naturally. We ask him to join us with coffee, to come and sit with us at coffee time. And we've had some incredible experiences, you know, when that happens. But one one thing that happens nearly always when we get out there and sit talk to the Lord birds begin to come parrots will fly in parrot flew in sat on my wife's hand and these are big big birds and, and it's like they will just come they will just come and uh, if we are late in getting up they will come and tap on the window in the bedroom <laughs> true they will tap on the window you haven't started your praise time yet yeah <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. And it's like, we have these black cockatoos with red tails, which are a big bird. And I tell you, when they come in, boy, the din is something else. But, you know, everything will start to respond to you, you know. And these people, like, I talked to this guy called Gerald Durstein, and he Sar- well, was in Sarasota, Florida now. And... Um, he said, when we came out of this, we could see God in everything. Everything, looked, the grass looked greener. It's like somebody had washed us with something. And suddenly the 
whole earth was full of the glory of the Lord. That's where I got into this. The whole earth was full of the glory of the Lord, see? But the fire is, you know, the fire does that. That sanctifying process of fire. You know, and, and it's going to be, it's going to be wonderful. You know, it's very interesting. With, remember Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego? It's just like Daniel 3.26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke and said, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, you mind, this guy's a heathen, but he said, You are servants of the Most High God. Come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth in the midst of the fire. You know, and it said all that had happened to them in the fire, that their shackles had been burnt off. Yes. <laughs> Everything else was intact. The shackles were gone. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Oh. No wonder he promoted them in the kingdom. I tell you, come out of the fire. Strongholds will be gone in the mind. Sexual chaff will be burned off. The, the inferiorities and hereditary problems will be gone. Hallelujah. Mantles will be activated. Glory to God. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. You know, the Lord talked to me. He said about the phoenix. The phoenix, you know, is a mythical bird. It's a sacred ancient Egyptian mythology and myths derived from it, you know. Said to live for 500 to 1400 years, depending on what source you're reading. And, uh, but it's a bird, beautiful gold, red plumage. At the end of its life cycle, the phoenix builds a nest of cinnamon twigs. And then it ignites both the nest and the bird burn fiercely, are reduced to ashes and a new bird arises out of the flame. You remember that? And, it, and it's like, you know, it became popular in early Christian art and literature and that kind of stuff as Christian symbolism of the resurrection. But you see, that's exactly what it's like. The new you will arise. This is the new creation man. Hallelujah. See, a lot of people are saved, but not many are born again. Ooh. Yeah, I didn't mean to say it, but it's, it's uh, true. To be truly born again is totally different from just being saved, you know. Being saved, you can go to heaven, but to be truly born again, you've been made into the image and likeness of Jesus. Hallelujah. Don't go out here and say, he told me I wasn't saved. You are saved. All right. Hallelujah. Oh. Once the fire has done its work. You know, it's very, very interesting. We've had this whole Harry Potter series. And uh, it, it's interesting, you know, this Christian woman came up to me and said, Is it okay for my, my children to go and see the Harry Potter stuff? So I looked at this lady. And I said, Well, if you want to introduce your children to witchcraft, it's a really good movie to go and watch. <laughs> You know, the mentality, I can't, can't understand it. I really can't understand it. This is introducing this generation to witchcraft. You know? But the last of his movies was The Order of the Phoenix. And, uh, you know, and we have this kind of feat, you know, this kind of... Satan is trying to get this generation of young people. Introducing them to witchback, video games, computer games. The whole barrage is out there with the young people today. And as they watch this, they become demonized. And, uh, you know, and it all happens. And, and, uh, but God's got a secret weapon. Hallelujah. <laughs> See? Once this fire comes, and then the cherubims come and the glory of the Lord is seen in the church and it's not church as usual anymore you know church to most young people today is really boring yeah. I'm not talking about you people I'm talking about <laughs> you know that's going to change young people are going to flock to the churches because they've already been introduced to the spiritual realm Satan didn't know what he'd done you know he's just like that <laughs> Oh boy, 
God, oh God always turns it around, you know. They've already been spiritually awakened, and suddenly this thing is happening now in the church. Whew, a whole army comes in, gets saved, you know. Satan never wins that, you know. And those kids are going to become part of the army of the Lord. You are going to have to train them. And there's no kind of nonsense. This has got to be real. You've got to be able to live in what you teach them. They can pick that a mile off, you know. You'll be living. You've got to be walking in this thing now after the fire's gone finished with you. You're walking in this. You train them. This generation will be trained very quickly and come to maturity very, very quickly. And we're going to have to watch our attitudes. You remember the parable of those who came and he said, I'll give you so much, you walk all the day in the vineyard? And they said, yeah, fine, we'll do. And then some came in at the last hour and got the same wages. And these people said, well, we complained about it. You know? And, 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 and there are some that have, that have brought, you know, come to this place of walking with God and paid a price, a real terrible price to get there. And, and, and they say, you know, t took us all this time fasting and praying and seeking God and this generation come in it and walk overnight in it. Attitudes. This generation is going to come to maturity real quick. Hallelujah. And we've got to let that happen and set them loose. And they're going to wreck the church. <laughs> Hallelujah. I tell you. I tell you, God's going to resurrect a whole new generation. You know, and there's nothing messes up graveyards like resurrections. I tell you. You know, they're going to mess up the church a bit. Because it won't be church as usual. You know, and these pe kids are going to be so on fire for God. If you try and curb them, boy, they'll just walk over you. They'll, God, the fire on fire for God, I tell you. You've got to loose them and let them go. You've got to accommodate. The church has got to be able to accommodate what God wants to do. It won't be church as normal. You know? And uh, these kids will be eager, eager, eager to get out there as missionaries in this world. Yeah. I tell you, you won't stop them. But first the fire has to come. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. And then, and then, and only then will the others come. The cherubim, the glory of the Lord, then will rest upon the church. Cherubims are carriers of the glory. And the glory of the Lord will rest, you know, upon the church. It, it tells us in Ezekiel, how are we going for time? Okay, it tells us in Ezekiel, very interesting passage of scripture. And if you've got your Bibles, come across because you need to look at some of this. Ezekiel chapter 10, okay? If you have your Bibles, just come with me to Ezekiel chapter 10. And we'll see how the glory of the Lord lifted off Israel, departed from them. And then later, much, much, many, 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 many years later, the glory of the Lord came back to Israel. Came back the same way as it went. And it says in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 4, Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub, and stood over the threshold of the house and the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory it says the glory of the Lord went up see the cherub the, the glory the presence of God was lifting off the nation of Israel and it left the tabernacle lifted off when they lifted up it lifted off and the cloud and the outer court now was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Okay? And then in verse 18, And the glory of the Lord departed from now the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight and went out. And everyone stood at the door of the east gate. 
Now notice this. Then the glory of the Lord departed off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. The cherubim gathered up the glory and left. Okay. And now, so first off the house, the house of the Lord, and now it's kind of lifting off, you know, and mounted up from the earth. And the glory of the Lord went with them. Then you come across to chapter 11, and verse 23, and it says this, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain. It was no longer in the city. It was no longer on the house of the Lord. It's no longer in the city. Now it's up on the mountains. When the serp turbans went up under the mountains, the glory followed them. And finally, they were gone. And a number of years ago, that's what happened in this nation. The glory of the Lord lifted off it. And uh, well, I want to tell you, Destiny has arrived. White horse is here. The cherubims and the seraphims are coming. God is going to breathe in favor on this nation. That doesn't mean to say you stop praying and interceding. You must do that. There are tremendous forces against this nation. And tremendous forces. Like, uh, uh, Timothy was saying against the White House, you really need to appreciate you know, what is going on in the realm of the spirit. And what he was saying about Israel and the choices this nation makes about Israel is absolutely the most critical thing in the nation. How America deals with Israel, how any nation deals with Israel, will determine the future of that nation. And, uh, but they're coming back. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you're alive in this generation? Oh, I tell you, they, they are coming. They are coming. It's kind of interesting, you know, that like kind of this, this time, this weekend, this time together that uh, Timothy is here and we're, we're all here together, you know, and it's like, it's like God wants to kick something off, you know, God wants to give us understanding of what is happening and I don't know where this, it could be other places of America, some people are getting the same kind, this, this angel may be visiting other people, probably visiting many other people, but we need to understand that, you know, it's a critical time now. And Moravian Falls has gone through a sifting. And I don't know anything about Moravian Falls, so you need, I've got no axe to grind here. Okay? Gone through a sifting and a repositioning, and God's about to move, move again. And uh, you're going to see oh, some incredible things come forth. God's going to do it very quickly. He's going to move very quickly. He's going to do, once this thing breaks, God's going to raise up movements, real movements. And those movements are going to be responsible for touching nation, not just this nation, but many nations of the world. And we're going to see God do that. And, and we really need to be, be sensitive, you know, to that whole thing. God's going to open up portals. We talk about it a lot, but you know, God's going to open up portals in different places of the world, and he's going to connect them, laterally. And that's what God, one of the things that God now is seeking to do, seeking to sort out, seeking to prepare, prepare us for. And uh, we're going to see this begin to happen. And, uh, you know, Moravian Falls have definitely got a heritage here. But it, you haven't entered into the full heritage what God has for this place. And it's been wonderful for what you've got here. But it's about to change again positively, positively in a whole new way. And we're going to see God do a new thing. Hallelujah. And, uh, oh, we've got to take an attitude, you know, saying, yes, I count me in, Lord. You know, I, I count me in on this. I'm settling for this. You know, I'd rather die and go home than stay where I am. That's got to be our attitude. Yes. You know? Uh, and uh, it's like, yeah, praise God. He's going to do it. We're going to see God work. And you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. It's exciting. Hallelujah. But once these angels, now I've got to be careful because that angel is listening to all my words here today. 
once those angels get to work, there's going to be revelation, understanding released so that we know what to do, we know what God has called us to do, and the provision for that is going to come with it. And, and we're going to be able to step into it and run, run with it. This is destiny. You see, it's going to be opened up, sparked. And we talked about those stones, those colored stones, that angel. I saw, you know, and he's just got to give you one stone. I'm just talking spiritually now. You know, whether you, get, whether you get a stone or not in the natural, it's not the point. These are just signs. But he imparts destiny or he awakens your destiny. And out of that, there is provision imparted. And once the destiny awakens, you see, everything you needed to fulfill your destiny was given to you before you ever came to this earth. And once that destiny is awakened, whew, it, come, it comes right in. Provision for you to walk in it. In every realm, financially, spiritually, every realm, it comes for you to be able to walk in that and walk out into it. And I don't care who you are today, young or old, experienced or non-experienced, this is a time of the awakening of your destiny. And we've heard for many, many years similar kind of things, but the time has come. This was written for a generation to come. This generation. And we're going to see God do what he's promised to do. You know, and it's, it's difficult because hope deferred makes the heart sick, you know? You know what it's like? We hear this, and, and, and it's like, yeah, the years go by, and where is it, you know? And, and that's all God testing our spirits. It's all part of the process, you know? And, and we come to the point, you know, and say, well, if it happens, it happens. You know, you must never come to that point. You must come to the point and say, I know things might be delayed. I know that, that it's been a long time. There doesn't seem to be anything happening. But that which God spoke to us is going to come to pass. And we stand on it. God has got some incredible things for us. You know? And, you know, Timothy was talking about, you know, we need another form of transport. I am, I am so tired of 20 hours on a plane. You know, it's like, oh my God, 20 hours? Like sitting in a metal tube for 20 hours, you know. God. You know, oh, and, and I was walking one time between my study and my, in the kitchen. And I never reached the kitchen. And I found myself on a plane, not a plane, a plane, <laughs> in Mongolia. And there were big mountains on the fourth side, but it was a very big plain and grassy, and it must have been spring or winter. It was very green. And um, there were a group of men about maybe 50, 100 yards away from me with horses. And I thought, Lord, I was on my way to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> See, I was in Mongolia. And so I started walking towards these men. And when I got within about 50 meters, so about 50 yards, say, yards, few yards, yeah. And they looked up and saw me. And of course, I was dressed differently. And they just all stared at me. And so I thought, well, I'm here, I may as well keep walking. And as I got got right close to I could smell their horses um, uh, and I could feel their horses and I'd smell them and, and it was like I walked up to them and I thought these are not going to understand my language I said but I'll talk to them anyway and so I began to talk to them and I was thinking in English and speaking in the Mongolian language and I talked to them about Jesus, the Son of God, the person they look to in the skies, the person they look to in creation. I know who he is, and I've been sent to tell you who he is. It's Jesus. And I talked to them for about an hour about Jesus, who he was, what he had done for them. Went through all of this, and I, re I remember as I was talking, a horse was kept nudging me all the time, you know, this horse, because the whole of creation stopped. You know? And, uh, then I said this, 
I have to leave, but someone will come soon to tell you more about this. And when I said that, I was still walking down the passage to the kitchen. The time had been suspended just for that moment. A few months later, my assistant pastor came and he said, Neville, I really feel I need to... I hadn't told anyone about this except my wife. And they said, Neville, he said, Neville, I really believe I need to take a team to Mongolia. And he's still working, you know, 15 years later in Mongolia, China, China borders and into Mongolia. You see, and that was just a promise of things to come. See, it was just like one of those grapes from the promised land. That's what it's like out there. Now you've got to go in and get it. You know? We talk about the grape, but you've got to go and get them. You see? You've got to go in there. Hallelujah. I'll encourage you. I'll give you hope. You know, we've waited and waited a long time, you know. Some longer than others. But you know, God's never late. He's got to prepare the way. And that first angel destiny is here. And the other angels are going to follow in, in order. The seraphims are next. And then after that, we're going to see the then, and only then, will the cherubims be able to come. The cherubims will not come until the fire has been. Then when that has happened, these guys will come. And when they turn up in the church, the house will be filled with a cloud, and no one will be able to stand to minister. And those things will go on for days. Oh, Hallelujah. God's got his answer, you see, for this generation. Right now, we're not hardly touching anything. And those great things are happening in many parts of the world. But you look across America. You look at your young people across America. You're not really touching them. Yo, some, and there's some good things happening. But not the majority. It's time. It's time. time he's going to come hallelujah